Hello. Hello, hello, hello to everybody who might watch this live and hello to those who might watch this later on YouTube. This is Self-Isolation Shakespeare and our performance of King Lear. We are a student-run group um, with the uh, goal of performing all of Shakespeare's canon live on Zoom. Let's see if we actually get there. Um, we, uh, I'd like to say a couple thank yous um, before we begin this reading. Um, I'd like to thank our team, which includes Jessica Graham, Liam Johnson, Lexi Thompson, and myself, and our um, amazing um, stage manager, Kirsten, uh, without whom none of this would be possible. Yeah, I'd also like to thank um, uh, our dramaturg for this reading, um, Andra Harbold, um, who for doing a really deep and um, thorough job um, and uh, giving us some really helpful stuff to work with. And I'd like to thank, lastly, uh, Backroom Shakespeare um, for, the, uh, for the cutting we're using for this performance, as well as Rob Miles, um, who is the creator of The Show Must Go Online, which is kind of the inspiration for this project. Um, I'm going to have the cast uh, introduce themselves, um, their character names, who they are, and also tell you where they are broadcasting from. So take it away. Hi, I'm Tom Nellis. I'll be reading Lear, and I'm broadcasting from Brooklyn. Hi, I'm Robert Scott Smith. I will be playing Gloucester, and I am broadcasting in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, I'm Sarah Shipperbotham. I will be reading Kent, and I'm broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, I'm Jessica Graham. I will be reading Cordelia, and I am broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, I'm Mary Helen Pittman. I'm going to be playing in Goneril, and I'm broadcasting from Flagstaff, Arizona. Hello, I'm Benjamin Young. I will be reading for Edmund, and I am broadcasting from Midvale, Utah. Hello, I am Morgan Werder. I'll be reading Regan, and I am also broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hello, I'm Amona Fatal, and I'll be reading the Duke of Albany, and I am broadcasting from Magna, Utah. Hi, my name is Matthew Rudolph, and I'll be reading the King of France, Gentleman and Captain, and I am broadcasting from Salt Lake City. Hi, I'm Nathan Allen Vaughn. I'll be reading for Cornwall, and I am in Brooklyn, New York. Hi, I'm Connor Johnson. I will be reading for Edgar, broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, I'm Colton Kirby, and I'm reading for Oswald, and I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hello, my name is Lexi Thompson. I'll be reading for Knight, Curran, Burgundy, and Servant, and I'm in Salt Lake City right now. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm reading The Fool, and I'm also in Salt Lake. Hi, my name's Lainey. I will be reading your stage directions, and I am also in Salt Lake. Okay, and without... Further ado, this is King Lear. Act one, scene one, King Lear's palace. Enter Kent, Glosker, and Edmund. I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It did always seem so to us, but now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which the dukes he values most, for qualities are so weighed that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is this not your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, have been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I am brazed to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could, whereupon she grew round wombed and had indeed, sir, a son for her cradle ere she had a husband for her bed. Do you smell a fault? I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have, sir, a son by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account, though his knave came something saucily into the world before he was sent for, yet was his mother fair. There was good sport at his making, and the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. 
my lord of Kent. Remember him hereafter as my honorable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and sue to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. Of so much I love you. What shall Cordelia do? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee, lady, to thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife to Cornwall? Speak. Sir, I am made of the same self-same metal that my sister is, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short, that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses, and find I am alone, felicitate in your dear highness's love. Then poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more richer than my tongue. Do thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom? No less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now our joy, although the last, not least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bonds. No more, nor less. How, oh, how, oh, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest it may mar your fortunes. Good, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as are right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sister's husbands, if they say they love you all? Haply, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. What goes thy heart with this? Ay, good my lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower by the secret radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be. Here I disclaim all my parental care, propinquity and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. The barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Good, my liege. Peace, Kent! Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight. So be my grave, my peace, as here I give her father's heart from her. Call France, who stirs? Call it Burgundy, Cornwall, and Albany. With my two daughters' dowers, digest this third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself, by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred nights, by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due terms. Only we still retain the name and all the additions to a king. The sway, revenue, execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours, which to confirm 
this coronet part betwixt you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honoured as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. What wilt thou do, old man? Think'st thou that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows? To plainness honours bound when majesty stoops to folly. Reverse thy doom, and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment, thy youngest daughter does not love thee least. Nor are those empty-hearted whose low sound reverbs no hollowness. Kent on thy life no more. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thy enemies. Nor fear to lose it, thy safety being the motive. Out of my sight! See better, Lear. And let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo. Now by Apollo, king, thou swearest thy gods in vain. Oh, vassal, miscreant. Laying his hand on his sword. Do, sir, forbear. Kill thy physician, and the fee bestow upon thy foul disease. Revoke thy doom, or whilst I can vent clamour from my throat, I'll tell thee thou dost evil. Hear me, recreant. On thine allegiance, hear me. Since thou hast sought to make us break our vows, which we durst never yet, and with strained pride to come between our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear, our potency made good, take thy reward. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from diseases of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. Away! By Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Fare thee well, king. Sith thus thou wilt appear, freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinkst, and hast most rightly said. And your large speeches, may your deeds approve, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kent, O oh princes, bids you all adieu, He'll shape his old course in a country new. Exit. Flourish. Re-enter Gloucester with King of France, Burgundy, and attendants. Here's France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address towards you, who with this king hath rivaled for our daughter. What in the least will you require in present dower with her? or cease your quest of love. Most royal majesty, I crave no more than what your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Right, noble Burgundy. When she was dear to us, we did hold her so, but now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands. If aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it with our displeasure pieced, and nothing more may fitly like your grace, she's there. And she is yours. I know no answer. Will you, with those infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and stranger with our oath, take her or leave her? Pardon me, royal sir. Election makes not up on such conditions. Then leave her, sir, for by the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wench whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is most strange. 
that she, that even but now was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, most best, most dearest, should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor. Sure, her offense must be of such a natural degree that monsters it, or your forvouched affection fallen into taint, which to believe of her must be faith that reasons without miracle could never plant in me. I yet beseech your majesty, if for I want that glibe and oily art to speak and purpose not, since what I was, since what I well intend, I'll do it before I speak, that you make known it is no vicious blot, murder, or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and favor. But even for want of that which I, for which I am richer, a still soliciting eye, in such a tongue as I am glad I have not, though not to have it hath lost me in your liking. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better. Is it but this? My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? Love's not love when it's mingled with regards that stand aloof from the entire point. Will you have her? She is herself a dowry. Royal Lear, give but that portion which yourself proposed, and here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing. I have sworn. I am firm. I am sorry, then. You have so lost a father that you must lose a husband. Peace be with Burgundy. Since that respects of fortune are his love, I shall not be his wife. Fairest Cordelia, that art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken and most love despised. Thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Gods, gods, tis strange that from their coldest neglect, my love should kindle to inflamed respect. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Thou hast her, France. Let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our grace, our love, our benison. Come, noble Burgundy. Exeunt, all but king of France, Goneril, Regan, and Cordelia. Bid, fel, bid farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father. With washed eyes, Cordelia leaves you. I know what you are. And like a sister, am most loath to call your faults as they are named. Use our father well. To your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet, alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Describe us not our duties. Let your study be to content your lord who hath received you at fortune's alms. You have obedience scanted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plated cunning hides. Who covers faults at last shame then derides? Well, may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Exeunt, King of France and Cordelia. Sister, it is not a little, I have to say, of what bo most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain, and with you, next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it hath not been little. He always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look to receive from his age not alone the imperfections of long engrafted condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of Kent's banishment. This is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. 
pray you, let's hit together. If our, father if our father carry authority with such dispositions as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall think further on it. We must do something, and in the heat. Excellent. Scene two. The Earl of Gloucester's castle. Enter Edmund with a letter. Thou, nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me, for that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base? When my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous and my shape as true as honest madam's issue, why brand they us with base? With baseness, bastardy, base, base. Who in the stealthy, lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed? Go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got tween a sleep and wake? Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now gods, stand up for bastards. Enter Gloucester. Kent banished thus, and France in collar parted, and the king's gone tonight. Edmund, how now, what news? So please your lordship, none. Putting up the letter. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No. What needed, then, that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing has not, some, has not such need to hide itself. Let's see, come, if it be nothing. I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your or looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see. Let's see. I hope for my brother's justification he wrote this, but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it has suffered. Come to me that, on, that of this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should have his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Hmm. Conspiracy. Sleep till I waked him? You should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar. Had he a hand to write this? A heart and brain to breed it in? When came this to you? Who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's. If the matter were good, my lord, I durst swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. Hath he never heretofore sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers declining, the father should be his ward to the son, and the son manage his revenue. Oh, villain, <laughs> villain. His very opinion in the letter, abhorred villain, unnatural, detested, brutish villain, worse than brutish. Go, Sarah, seek him. I'll apprehend him, abominable villain. Where is he? I do not well know, my lord, if it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you shall run a certain course, where, if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, 
It would make a great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for him that he hath wrote this to feel my affection to your honor and to no further pretense of danger. Think you so? He cannot be such a monster. Nor is not, sure. To his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth. Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I would unstate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies. In countries, discord. In palaces, treason. And the bond cracked twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction. Their son against father. The king calls. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, hallowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. His offense, honesty, tis strange. Exit. This is the excellent foppery of the world that, when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeit of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and the stars, as if we were villains by necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treachers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by divine thrusting on, an admirable evasion of foremaster man to lay his goatish disposition to the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows, I am rough and lecherous. Tut, I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Edgar. Enter Edgar. And Patty comes. How now, Brother Edmund? What serious contemplation are you in? I'm thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day, what should follow these eclipses. <laughs> Do you busy yourself about that? I promise you, the effects he writes of succeed unhappily. When saw you my father last? Why, uh, the, the night gone by. Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms. Found you no know, displeasure in him by word or countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence till some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, have a continent forbearance till the spite of his rage goes slower. And as I say, Retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray ye, go, there's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best, go armed. I am no honest man if there be any good meaning towards you. I have told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly, nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you, away. Shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. Exit, Edgar. A credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit, all with me's meat that I can fashion fit. Exit. Scene three, the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Oswald, her steward. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding his fool? By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. 
His knights grow riotous and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. He's coming, madam. I hear him. Horns within. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'll have it come to question. If he dislike it, let him to our sister, whose mind and mine, I know in that are one, not to be overruled. Remember what I tell you. Well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter. Advise your fellow so. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my, uh, to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. Exeunt. Scene four. A hall in the same. Enter Kent, disguised. If but as well I other accents borrow, that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raised my likeness. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come, thy master whom thou lovest shall find thee full of labours. Horns within, enter King Lear and attendants. Let me not stay a jot for dinner. Go, get it ready. Exit an attendant. And now, what art thou? A man, sir. What dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? You. What services canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, mar a curious tale in telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified in, and the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing, nor so old to <laughs> dote on her for anything. I have years on my back, forty-eight. Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee, yet. Dinner! Oh, dinner! Where's my knave, my fool? Go you, go, call my fool hither. Exit an attendant. Enter Oswald and a knight. You, you, Sarah, where's my dinner? Where's my daughter? So please you, I... Exit Oswald. What says the fellow there? Call the clot pole back. Exit a knight. Where's my fool? Oh, I think the world's asleep. Re-enter knight. Oh no, where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came not the slave back to me when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest answer. He would not. He would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependence as in the duke himself, also, and your daughter. Ah, sayest thou so? I beseech you, pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken, for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wrong. Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late which I had rather blamed as mine own jealous curiosity than as a very pretense and purpose of unkindness. I will look further into it. But where's my fool? I have not seen him this two days. Go, you, call hither my fool. Exit an attendant, re-enter Oswald. Oh, you, sir, you. Come, you, hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father? Your lord's knave, your whoresome dog, your slave, you cur! I am none of these, my lord. I, I beseech your pardon. You bandy looks with me, you rascal! Striking him. I will not be struck, my lord. Nor tripped neither, you base football player. Tripping up his heels. I thank thee, fellow, thou servest me, and I love thee. Let me hire him, too. Here's my coxcomb. Offering Kent his cap. Ah, oh, now, my pretty knave. 
How dost thou? Sarah, you had best take my coxcomb. Why, fool? Why, for taking one's part that's out of favor. Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits. Thou catch cold shortly. There, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow hath banished two aunt's daughters and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. How now, Nuncle? Take heed, Sarah, the whip. Ooh, truth's a dog must a kennel. He must be whipped out. Sarah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, Nuncle. Give me an egg, Nuncle, and I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Why, after I cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle, thou gavest away both and gavest away both parts, thou borest thy ass on thy on thy back or the dirt. Thou hast little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest away thy gold gavest thy golden one away. Thou madest thy daughters thy mothers, for when thou gavest them the rod and puts down thine own breeches, then they for then they for sudden joy did weep. Prithee, Nuncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. And you lie, Sarah, we'll have you whipped. I don't know what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true. Thou'll have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I'm whipped for holding my peace. I'd rather be any kind of thing than a fool. And yet, it would not be thee, Nuncle. Thou hast paired thy wit of both sides and left nothing in the middle. Here comes one of the pairings. Enter Goneril. Ah, now, daughter, what makes that frontlet on? Methinks you are too much of late in a frown. Ugh, thou wast a pretty fool when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue, so your face bids me, though you say nothing. Mum, mum. He that keeps nor crust nor crumb, weary, weary of all, shall want some. Pointing to that's King. A she that's a shield peas cod. Not only, sir, this your all-licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress. But now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoke and done, that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance. Are you our daughter? Come, sir, I would you, I would you would make use of that great wisdom, wherefore, whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions that of late transform you from what you rightly are. Doth any here know me? This is not Lear. Doth Lear walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Who is it can tell me who I am? Lear's shadow. Your name, fair gentlewoman? This admiration, sir, is much of the savior of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright. As you are old and reverend, you should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so deboshed and bold, that this our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself doth speak for instant remedy. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs. A little to disquaintity your train, and the remainder that shall still depend, to be such men as may besort your age and know themselves and you. Darkness and devils! Saddle my horses, call my train together, degenerate. Bastard, I'll not trouble thee. Yet have I left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Enter Albany. Woe, the too late repents. Oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir. Prepare my horses. In gratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou shows thee in a child than the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. Detested kite, thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest parts that in all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. 
O oh, most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordelia show? Oh, Lear, Lear, Lear! Be at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. My lord, I am guiltless, as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Dear nature, dear, dear goddess, here. Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her delicate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may live and be athwart this nature torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth with cadent tears for channels in her cheeks. Turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Away, away, life and death. I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus, that these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them. Yeah. Is it come to this? Let it be so. Yet have I left a daughter who I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear this of thee with her nails, she'll flay thy wolvish visage. Thou shalt find that I'll resume the shape which thou didst think I have cast off forever. Thou shalt, I warrant thee. Exeunt King Lear, Kent, Fool and Attendants. Do you mark that, my lord? I cannot be so partial, Goneril. To the great love I bear you. Pray you content. What, Oswald, ho! Oh, this man hath had good counsel. A hundred knights. Each buzz, each fancy, each complaint dislike. He may engard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say! Well, you may fear too far. What he hath uttered, I have writ my sister. If she sustain him and his hundred knights, when I have showed the unfitness. Re-enter Oswald. How now, Oswald? What, have you writ that letter to my sister? Yes, madam. Take you some company and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear. Exit Oswald. No, no, my lord. This milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn not, yet under pardon, you are much more a task for want of wisdom than praised for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to better, oft we mar what's well. Exeunt. Act two, scene one. Gloucester's castle. Enter Edmund and Curran. Meet him. Save thee, Curran. And you, sir. I have been with your father and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan, his duchess, will be with him there this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean, the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Not I. Pray you, what are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward twixt the Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do then, in time. Very well, sir. Exit, Curran. The Duke be here tonight? The better, best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. Brother, a word! Descend, brother, I say! Enter Edgar. My father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He's coming hither, now, in the night, in the haste, and Regan with him. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I am sure on it, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw! 
Seem to defend yourself. Now quit you well. Yield! Come before my father! Light! Ho! Here! Fly, brother. Torches! Torches! So, farewell. Exit, Edgar. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion. <clears throat> Cuts his own arm. Of mine own, of my more fierce endeavor. Father! Father! Enter Gloucester with servants with torches. Now, Edmund, wh where's the villain? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir, when by no means he could... Pursue him. Ho, go after. Exeunt some servants. By no means what? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But that I told him the revenging gods gainst parricides did all their thunders bend. Spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father. Sir, in fine, with his unprepared sword he charges home my unprovided body, lanced mine arm, but when he saw my best alarmed spirits, full suddenly he fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught. My worthy arch and patron comes tonight. By his authority I will proclaim it, that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous coward to the stake. He that conceals him, death. When I dissuaded him from his intent, I threatened to discover him. He replied, thou unpossessing bastard. Does thou think if I would stand against thee with the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in thee, make thy words faith? Trumpets within. Hark, the duke's trumpet. I know not why he comes. All ports all bar. The villain shall not scape. The duke must grant me that. Besides his picture, I will send far and near, that all the kingdom may have the due note of him, and of my land, loyal and natural boy. I'll work the means to make thee capable. Enter Cornwall, Regan, and attendants. How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What? Did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named, your Edgar? Oh, lady, lady, shame would have hit it. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon my father? I know not, madam. Tis too bad, too bad. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. No marvel, then, though he were ill-affected. I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them, and with such cautions, that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I, assure thee, Regan. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. Make your own purpose how in my strength you please. For you, Edmund, whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much commend itself, you shall be ours. Nature of such deep trust we shall much need, you we first seize upon. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. Lay comforts to your bosom, and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves this instant it use. I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Exeunt. Scene two, before Gloucester's castle. Enter Kent and Oswald, severally. Good dawning to thee, friends. Art of this house. Aye. Where may we set our horses? With a mire. Uh, prithee, if thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why, then? I care not for thee. If I had thee in lips repinfold, I would make thee care for me. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, free-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted, stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking knave, a whore-son, glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue, one trunk-inheriting slave, one that wouldst be aboard in way of good service, and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, panda, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch. 
one whom I will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou, thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee? What a brazen-faced varlet art thou to deny thou knowest me, draw your rogue. For though it be night, yet the moon shines. I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you. Draw your horse, uncullenly barbamunga, draw. Away, I have nothing to do with thee. Can you tell me my next line? My script's frozen. Draw, you rascal. You come with draw. letters against... Draw, you rascal. Yeah, uh, you come with letters against the king. Draw, you rogue. Or so, uh, Shakronado, you shakes, draw. Draw, you rascal, you come with letters against the king. Draw, you rogue, or also carbonado your shanks. Draw, you rascal. Help! Ho! Murder! Help! Strike, you slave. Stand, rogue, stand. You need slave, strike! Help! Eating him. Oh! Murder! Murder! Enter Edmund with his rapier drawn. Cornwall, Regan, Gloucester, and servants. Weapons, arms, w w what's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives. He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. No marvel you have so bestirred your valor. Your, you cowardly rascal, nature disclaims thee. This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I spared at suit of his gray beard, Spear my gray beard, you wagtail! Peace, sirrah! You beastly knave, know you no reverence? Yes, sir, but anger hath a privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a slave as this should wear a sword, who wears no honesty. Smile you, my speeches, as I were a fool. <laughs> Goose, if I've had you upon Surum Plain, I'll drive ye cackling home to Camelot. Why, art thou mad, old fellow? How fell you out? Say that. His no countenance more. likes no more, me not. No more, perchance, does mine, nor his, nor hers. Sir, tis my occupation to be plain. I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder I see before me at this instant. This is so, fellow. What was the offense you gave him? I never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master very light, to, to, late, to strike at me. Upon his misconstruction, when he, conjunct and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put him in such a deal of man that worthied him, got praises of the king, and in the fleshment of his dread exploit, drew on me here again. None of these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fool. Fetch forth the stocks. You stubborn ancient knave, you reverend braggart, we will teach you. Sir, I am too old to learn. I call not your stocks for me. I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do some small respect, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stalking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks. As I have life and honor, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon, till night, my lord, and all night too. <laughs> Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same color our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Stocks brought out. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. The king must take it ill that he so slightly valued in his messenger should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Put in his legs. Kent is put in the stocks. Come, my good lord, away. Exeunt all but Gloucester and Kent. I am sorry for thee, friend. I'll entreat for thee. Pray do not, sir. I have watched and travelled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out, the rest I'll whistle. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. Twill be ill taken. Exit Gloucester.
good king, but must approve the common soul. Thou out of heaven's benediction comest to the warm sun. Fortune, good night, smile once more, turn thy wheel. Sleeps. Scene three, a wood. Enter Edgar. I have heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escape the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself and, and, and be thought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury in contempt of man brought near to beast. My, my face I'll grime with filth, uh, blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots, uh, and with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of, of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary, and, and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats and mills, sometime with lunatic vans, sometime with prayers enforce their charity. Poor, poor, poor Turley God, poor, poor Tom. That's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Exit, scene four, before Gloucester's castle. Kent is in the stocks. Enter King Lear and Fool. Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. Hail to thee, noble master. Ah! Mix thou this shame thy pastime? No, my lord. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yes. No, no, they would not. Yes, they have. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Juno, I swear I. They durst not do it. They could not, would not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respects such violent outrage. My lord, when at their home, I did commend your highness letters to them. Ere I was risen from the place that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril his mistress salutations, delivered letters, spite of intermission, which presently they read, on whose contents they summoned up their many, straight took horse, commanded me to follow and attend at the leisure of their answer gave me cold looks. And meeting here the other messenger, being the very fellow that of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, within. Follow me not. Stay here. Exit Lear. How chance the king comes with so small a train. Ah, uh, and thou hast set in the stocks for that question, thou hast well deserved it. Why, fool? We'll, we'll set thee to school to an ant, to teach thee there's no laboring of the winter. Let go thy hold when, the, when a great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following it. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That, sir, which serves and seeks for gain and follows but for form, will pack when it begins to rain and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay, and let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away. The fool, no knave, per thee. Well learned you this, fool. Not in the stocks, fool. Re-enter King Lear with Gloucester. Deny to speak with me. They are sick. They are weary. They have traveled all the night. Mere fetches, 
fetch me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery. What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I'll speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Inform them? Dost thou understand me, man? I, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak, commands her service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood, fiery, the fiery duke. Tell the hot duke that, no, but not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office whereto our health is bound. We are not ourselves. Go tell the Duke and his wife, I'd speak with them. Now, presently, bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Exit Gloucester. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart. But down. Cry to it, Nuncle, as the cockney did to the eels when she put him in the paste alive. She napped him on the coxcomb with a stick and cried, down, wantons! Down! Enter Cornwall, Regan, Gloucester, and servants. Good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. Kent is set free. I am glad to see your highness. Regan, I think you are, beloved Regan. Thy sister is not. Oh, Regan, she has tied sharp tooth on kindness like a vulture. Here, I can. Scarce speak to thee, not, not believe, with how depraved a quality. Oh, Regan! I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope. You less know how to value her desert than she to scant her duty. Say, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If, sir, perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers, tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curse is on her! Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you that to our sister you do make return. Say you have wronged her, sir. Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how this becomes the house? Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On my knees, I beg that you vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good, sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue, most serpent-like, upon the very heart. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her in grateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Oh, the blessed gods, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is set on. No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender, hefted nature shall not give thee or to, or to harshness. Her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. Tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures, to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion, to oppose the bolts against my coming in. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude. By half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot wherein I thee endowed. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? Trumpet within. What trumpet's that? I note my sister's. This approves her letter that she would soon be here. Enter Oswald. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows, out from my sight. 
What means your grace? Who stopped my servant? Regan, I have good hope thou didst not know it. Who comes here? Oh, heavens. Enter Goneril. If you do love old men, send down and take my part. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard. Oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offense that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh, besides, you are too tough. Will you yet hold? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir. But his own disorders deserved him much uh, less advancement. You did you? I pray you, father, being weak seems so. If, till the expiration of your month, you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home, and out of that provision, which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her, and fifty men dismissed. No, I rather abjure all roofs, and choose to wage against the enmity of the air. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. Pointing at Oswald. At your choice, sir. My pretty daughter, do not make me mad. I will draw not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister, for those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so, but she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, 50 followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Yea, or so many, sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number. How in one house should many people under two commands hold amity? Tis hard, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all! And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositaries, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What? Must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan? Send you so. And speak again, my lord, no more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look well favored when others are more wicked. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh, reason, not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs man's life's as cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, you heavens, give me patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stir these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No. You unnatural hags! I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall. I will do such things. 
What they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool! I shall go mad! Exeunt King Lear, Gloucester, Kent, and Fool. Storm and Tempest. Let us withdraw, it will be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame, hath put himself from rest, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So am I purposed. Where is my lord Glo uh, Gloucester? Re-enter Gloucester. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse, but will I know not whither? Tis best to give him way, he leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on, and the bleak winds do sorely ruffle. For many miles about there's scarce a bush. Oh, sir, to willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. Shut up your doors, my lord. Tis a wild night. My regan counsels well. Come, out of the storm. Exeunt. Intermission. We will now take a 10 minute intermission.
five minutes to places. This is five minutes to places. Act three, scene one, a heath, storm still, enter Kent and a gentleman, meeting. Who's there, besides foul weather? One minded like the weather, most unquietly. I know you, where's the king? Contending with the fretful elements, bids the winds blow the earth into the sea, or the swelled curled water above the main, that things might change or cease. But who's with him? None but the fool, who labours to outjest his heart-struck injuries. Fie on this storm! I will go seek the king. He that first lights on him, holler the other. Exuant Severly. Scene two, another part of the heath. Storm still. Enter King Lear and the fool. <laughs> Blow winds and crack your cheeks! Rage! Blow! You cataracts and hurricanes spout till you have drenched our steeples, drown the cocks. You sulfurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers to oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head. And thou, oh, oh, shaking thunder, smite. Flat the thick rotundity of the world. Crack nature's molds all germane spill at once that make it grateful man. Oh, nuncle, court holy water in a dry house is better than this rainwater out of door. Good nuncle, in and ask your daughter's blessing. Here's a night pity's neither wise man nor fool. Rumble thy bellyful, spit fire, spout rain. No rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax you not, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. 
You owe me no subscription. Let it fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I call you servile ministers that have with two pernicious daughters joined your high engendered battles against a head so old and white as this. Oh, 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 tis foul. Enter Kent. Who's there? Mary, here's a grace and a codpiece. It's a wise man and a fool. Alas, sir, are you here? Things that love night love not such nights as these. The wrathful skies gallow the very wanderers of the dark and make them keep their caves. Man's nature cannot carry the affliction nor the fear. Let the great gods that keep this dreadful potter o'er our heads find out their enemies now. I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Alack, bareheaded. Gracious, my lord, hard by here is a hovel. Some friendship will it lend you against the tempest, repose you there. My wits begin to turn. Come on, my boy, how dost my boy? Art cold, <laughs> I am cold myself. Where is this straw, my fellow? The art of our necessities is strange that can make vile things precious. Come, your huddle. Scene three, Glosker's castle. Enter Glosker and Edmund. Alack, alack, Edmund. I like not this unnatural dealing. When I desire their leave that I might pity him, they took from me the use of mine own house, charged me on pain of their perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him, entreat for him, nor any way sustain him. Most savage and unnatural. Go to, say you nothing. There's a division betwixt, betwixt the dukes, and a worse matter than that. I have received a letter this night. Tis dangerous to be spoken. I have locked the letter in my closet. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged home. There's part of a power already footed. We must incline to the king. I will seek him and privily relieve him. Go you and maintain talk with the duke that my charity be not of him perceived. Edmund, pray you, be careful. Exit. This courtesy forbid thee shall the duke instantly know, and of that letter too. This seems a fair deserving, and must draw me that which my father loses no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. Exit. Scene four, the heath, before a hovel. Enter King Lear, Kent, and a fool. Here is the place, my lord. Good my lord, enter. Leave me alone. Good my lord, enter here. Will break my heart. I'd rather break mine own. Good my lord, enter. Thy body's delicate. The tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats there. Filial ingratitude. Is it not as this mouth should tear this hand for lifting food to it? But I will punish home. No, I will weep no more. In such a night to shut me out, porn I will endure. In such a night as this, oh, Regan, Goneril. Your own kind father, whose frank heart gave all. Oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that, no more of that. Good my lord, enter here. In, boy, go first. Fool goes in. Ah! Come not in here, uncle. Here's a spirit. Help me, help me. Give me the hand. Who's there? A spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. What art thou that dost grumble in the straw? Come forth. Enter Edgar, disguised as a madman. Away, the foul fiend follows me. Through the sharp hawthorn blows the cold wind. Home, go to thy bed and warm thee. 
hast thou given all to thy two daughters? And art thou come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom, whom the foul fiend hath led through the fire and through flame and through ford and whirlpool air bog and quagmire that hath lain knives under his pillow and halters in his pew sits rat stain by his porridge made film proud of heart to ride on a bay trotting horse over four inch bridges to course his own shadow for a traitor bless thy five wits arms are cold oh do dee do dee do dee do dee bless thee from whirlwind storm still what have his daughters brought him to this past couldst thou save nothing didst thou give them all nay he reserved a blanket else had we all been shamed he hath no daughters sir yes traitor nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowness but his unkind daughters is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have thus little mercy on their flesh is no man more than this consider him well an accommodated man is no more but such a poor bare forked animal as thou art off off you lendings come un unbutton here tearing off his clothes privy nuncle be contented tis a naughty night to swim in now a little fire in a wild field were like an old lecher's heart a small spark all the rest on's body cold look here comes a walking fire enter gloucester with a torch this is the foul fiend liberty gibbet he begins at curfew and walks till the first cock he gives the web and the pin squints the eye and makes the hair lip mildews the white wheat and hurts the poor creature of the earth and aroid thee witch aroid thee poor tom's a cold go in with me my duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands though their injunction be to bar my doors and let this tyrannous night take hold upon you yet have i ventured to come seek you out and bring you where both fire and food is ready first let me talk with this philosopher what is the cause of thunder good my lord take his offer go into the house i'll take a word with this same learned theban what is your study how to prevent the fiend and to kill vermin let me ask you one word in private importune him once more to go my lord his wits begin to unsettle canst thou blame him storm still his daughters seek his death oh that good kent he said it would be thus poor banished man thus sayest the king grows mad i'll tell thee friend i am almost mad myself i had a son now outlawed from my blood he sought my life the grief hath crazed my wits what a night this i do beseech your grace oh cry your mercy sir noble philosopher your company tom's a cold in fellow there into the hovel keep thee warm come let's in all oh. this way my lord with him i will keep still with my philosopher good my lord soothe him let him take the fellow take him you on sirrah come on go along with us come good athenian no words no words hush exeunt scene five gloucester's castle enter cornwall and edmund i will have my revenge ere i depart this house this is the letter he spoke of which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of france oh heavens that this treason were not were not i the detector 
if the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. True or false, it hath made the Earl of Gloucester seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. I will persevere in my course of loyalty, though the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay trust upon thee, and thou shalt find a, a dearer father in my love. Exeunt. Scene six. A chamber in a farmhouse adjoining the castle. Enter Gloucester, King Lear, Kent, Fool, and Edgar. Here is better than the open air. Take it thankfully. I will piece out the comfort with what addition I can. I will not be long from you. Exit Gloucester. All the power of his wits have given way to his impatience. The gods reward your kindness. Exeunt. Scene seven. Gloucester's castle. Enter Cornwall, Regan, Goneril, Edmund, and servants. Oh, speedily to my lord, your husband. Show him this letter. The army of France is landed. Seek out the villain Gloucester. Exeunt some of the servants. Hang him instantly. Leave him to my displeasure, Edmund. Keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitorous father are not fit for your beholding. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my Lord of Gloucester. Enter Oswald. How now? Where's the king? My Lord of Gloucester hath conveyed him hence. Uh, some five or six or thirty of his knights are gone with him towards Dover, where they boast to have well-armed friends. Get horses for your mistress. Farewell, sweet lord and sister. Edmund, farewell. Exeunt Goneril, Edmund, and Oswald. Who's there? The traitor? Enter Gloucester, brought in by two or three. <sighs> Great old fox, tis he. Bind fast his corky arms. <sighs> what mean your graces? Good, my friends, consider. You are my guests. Ugh, do not foul play, friends. Bind him, I say. <clears throat> Servants bind him. <laughs> Hard, hard. Oh, filthy traitor. Unmerciful lady as you are, I'm none. To this chair bind him. Villain, thou shalt find. Regan plucks his beard. Ah, oh, by the kind gods, tis most ignobly done to pluck me by my beard. <laughs> so white and such a traitor. I am your host. With robber's hands my hospitable favors you should not ruffle thus. What will you do? Come, sir, what letters have you had late from France? Be simple, answerer, for we know the truth. And what confederacy have you with the traitors, late-footed in the kingdom? To whose hand have you sent the lunatic king? Speak! I have a letter guessingly set down, which came from one that's of a, a neutral heart and not from one opposed. Cunning. And false. Where hast thou sent the king? To Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Wast thou not charged at Wherefore where to Dover? Let him answer first. Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh stick boorish fangs, all cruels else subscribed. But I shall see the winged vengeance overtake such children. Seat shalt thou never. Fellows, hold the chair. Upon these eyes of thine I will set my foot. He that will think to live till he be old, give me some help, O oh, cruel, O oh, you gods. <laughs> One side will mock another, the other too. If you see vengeance. Hold your hand, my lord. I have served you ever since I was a child, but better service have I never done you than now to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If I did ever wear a beard upon your chin, I'd shake it on this quarrel. What do you mean? My villain. They draw and fight. Nay then, come on and take the chance of anger. Give me thy sword. A peasant stand up thus takes the sword and runs at him behind. Oh. 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 I am slain, my lord, 
You have one eye left to see some mischief on him. Ugh. Dies. Let's see, it, lest it seem more prevented. Out, file of joy. Where's thy luster now? Stabs out his other eye. Ah! Oh, oh, all dark and comfortless. Where's my son Edmund? Edmund, enkindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act. Out, treacherous villain. Thou callst on him that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us. Who is too good to pity thee? Oh, my follies, then Edgar was abused. Kind gods, forgive me that and prosper him. Go thrust him out at gates and let him smell his way to Dover. Exit one with Gloucester. How is my lord? How look you? I have received a hurt. Follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless villain. Throw this slave upon the dunghill. Regan, I bleed a pace. Untimely comes this hurt. Give me your arm. Exeunt. Scene four, or act four. Scene one, the heath. Enter Edgar. But who comes here? Enter Gloucester, led by an old man. My father. Poorly led. World, world, oh world, you cannot see your way. I have no way and therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw, full oft is seen, our means secure us and our mere defects prove our commodities. Oh, dear son Edgar, the food of thy abused father's wrath, might I but live to see thee in my touch? I'd say I had eyes again. Oh, gods. Who wist can say I am at the worst? I am worse than e'er I was, and worse I may be yet. The worst is not, so long as we can say this is the worst. Come hither, fellow. Oh, glad bless, bless thy sweet eyes. They bleed. Knowest thou the way to Dover? Both style and gate, horseway and footpath. <laughs> poor, poor Tom hath, hath been scared out of his wits. Bless thee, good man's son, from the foul fiend. There is a cliff whose high and bending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it, and I'll repair the misery thou dost bear with something rich about me. From that place I shall no leading need. Give me thy arm. Poor, poor Tom shall lead thee. Exeunt. Scene two. Before Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Edmund. Welcome, my lord. I marvel our mild husband not met us on the way. Now, where's, now, where's your master? Madam, within, but never so man changed. I told him of the army that was landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was, the worse of Gloucester's treachery, and of the loyal service of his son. When I informed him, then he called me sought, and told me I, I had turned the wrong side out. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dares not undertake. He'll not feel wrongs which tie him to an answer. Our wishes on the way may prove effects. Back, Edmund, to my brother. Hasten his musters and conduct his powers. I must change arms at home and give the distaff into my husband's hands. This trusty servant shall pass between us. Ere long you are like to hear, if you dare venture in your own behalf, a mistress's command. Wear this, spare speech. Giving a favor. Decline your head. This kiss, if it durst speak, would stretch thy lips up into the air. Conceive and fare thee well. Yours in the ranks of death. My most dear Gloucester. Exit Edmund. Oh, the difference of man and man. To thee a woman's services are due. Madam, here comes my lord. Exit. Enter Albany. I have been worth the whistle. Oh, Goneril, you are not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. Milk-livered man, that bears to cheek for blows a head for wrongs. Who hast not in thy brows an eye discerning thine honor from thy suffering? See thyself, devil. Gloucester's eyes. 
Where was his, where was his son when they did take his eyes? Uh, come with my lady hither. He is not here. No, my good lord, I met him back again. Was he the wickedness? And I, my good lord, uh, t'was he informed against him, and quit the house on purpose, that their punishment might have uh, the freer course. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou showedst the king, and to revenge thine eyes. Exeunt. Scene four. A tent. Enter with drum and colors, Cordelia, doctor, and soldiers. Alack, tis he. Why, he was met even now as mad as the vexed sea, singing aloud, crowned with rank fumiter and furrow weeds, with burdocks, hemlock, nettles, cuckoo flowers, darnel, and all the idle weeds that grow in our sustaining corn. A century send forth, search every acre in the high-grown field, and bring him to our eye. O oh, blessed secrets, O oh, you unpublished virtues of the earth, spring with my tears, be aidant and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him, lest his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. The British powers are marching hitherward, tis known before our preparation stands in expectation of them. O oh, dear father, it is thy business that I go about. Therefore, great France, my mourning and important tears hath pitied. No blown ambition doth our arms incite, but love, dear love, and our aged father's right. Soon may I hear and see him. Exeunt, scene five, Gloucester's castle. Enter Regan and Oswald. But are my brother's powers set forth? Aye, madam. Himself in person there. Uh, madam, with much ado, your sister is the better soldier. Lord Edmund spake not with your lord at home? No, madam. What might import my sister's letter to him? I know not, lady. Our troops set forth tomorrow. Stay with us, the ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? But like something, I know not what. I'll love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I had rather- I know your lady does not love her husband. I am sure of that. And at her late being here, she gave strange allades and most speaking looks to noble Edmund. I know you are of her bosom. I, madam? I speak in understanding. You are, I note. Therefore, I do advise you, take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked, and more convenient is he for my hand than for your ladies. You may gather more. If you do find him, pray you, give him this. And when your mistress hears thus much from you, I pray, desire her call her wisdom to her. So, fare you well. If you do chance to hear that blind traitor, Preferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would, would I could meet him, madam. I should show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. Exeunt. Scene six. Fields near Dover. Enter Gloucester and Edgar dressed like a peasant. When shall we come to the top of that same hill? You do climb up it now. Look how we labor. Methinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy tis to cast one's eyes so low. The, crow the crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire, dreadful trade. He thinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice and yawn tall anchoring bark, diminished to her cock, her cock a buoy, almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebbles chafes cannot be heard so high. 
I'll look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon, I would not leap upright. Let go of my hand. Here, friends, another purse, in it a jewel, well worth a poor man's taking. Fairies and gods prosper it with thee. Go thou, farther off, bid me farewell and let me hear thee going. Now fare you well, good sir. With all my heart. Why I do truffle th trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. O oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce and in your sights shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposalous wills, my snuff and loathe part of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, oh, bless him now, fellow. Fare thee well. He falls forward. Gone, sir. Farewell. Ho, oh, you, sir. Friend. Hear you, sir, speak. <laughs> Thus he might pass indeed. Yet, yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away and let me die. Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou shivered like an egg. But thou dost breathe, hast heavy substance. Leads not, speaks, art sound. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Thy life's in me. Speak yet again. But have I fallen or no? From the dread summit of this chalky bourne, look up a height, the shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do he but look up. Alack, I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Give me your arm. Up, so. How is? You, you, your legs? You stand. Too well, too well. Above all strangeness, upon the crown of the cliff, uh, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns whelked and waved like the enriched sea. It was some fiend. I do remember now that thing you speak of. I took it for a man. Often t'would say, the fiend, the fiend. He led me to that place. Bear free and patient thoughts. But who comes here? Enter King Lear, fantastically dressed with wild flowers. Oh, thou side-piercing sight, sweet Marjor Jam. Pass! 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 I know that voice. Ah! Goggle with a white beard! <laughs> They flattered me like a dog and told me I had white hairs in my beard ere the black ones were there. To say, I am no to everything I said. I am no to was no good divinity. When the rain came to wet me at once and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found them. I smelt them out. Go to. They are not men of their words. They told me I was everything. It is a lie. I am not ague proof. The trick of that voice I do well remember. Hiss not the king? I every inch of king. When I do stare, see how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was the cause? Adultery. <laughs> Thou shalt not die. <laughs> die for adultery? No. The wren goes to it, and the small gilded fly does lecher in my sight. Let 
copulation thrive. For Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughters got tween the lawful sheets to its luxury pell mill. For I lack soldiers. <laughs> Be, uh, behold, yon simpering dame, whose face between her forks presages snow that minces virtue, that doth shake the head to hear of pleasure's name. The fits you, not a soiled horse goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist, there are centaurs, though women all above, but to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. There's hell, there's darkness, there's the sulfurous pit, burning, scalding, stench, consumption, fire. Fie, fie, pa, pa! Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary, to sweeten my imagination. There's money for thee. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first, it smells of mortality. Oh, ruined piece of nature, this great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squinty at me? <laughs> no, to thy words, blind Cupid, I'll not love. Read thou this challenge, mark but the pinning of it. Were all the letters sung, I could not see one. I would not take this from her port. It is, and my heart breaks at it. Read! What, with a case of eyes? What, art mad? <laughs> A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Hark in thine ear. Change places and handy dandy, which is the justice and which is the thief? <laughs> Thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar. Aye, sir. And the creature run from the cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. A dog's obeyed in office. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back. Thou hotly lusted to use her in that kind for which thou whips her. The usurer hangs the cousiner. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plate sin with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Arm it in rags, a pygmy's straw does pierce it. <laughs> none does offend, none, I say none. I label them. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician, seem to see the things thou dost not. Now, 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 now. Pull off my boots. Harder, harder. So. Oh, matter and impertinency mixed. Reason and madness. If thou wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. My name is Gloucester. Thou well, must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee, Mark. Alack, alack the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. <laughs> this is a good block. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. I'll put it in proof, and when I have stolen upon these sons-in-law, then kill, 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 kill. Enter a gentleman with attendance. Oh, here he is. Lay hand upon him, sir, your most dear daughter. No rescue? What? Uh, 
prisoner. I am even the natural fool of fortune. Use me well. You shall have ransom. Let me have the surgeons. I am cut to the brains. You shall have anything. I will die bravely like a bridegroom. What? I will be jovial. Come, come. I am a king, my masters. Know you that? You are a royal one, and we obey you. Oh, then there is life in it. Nay, if you get it, you shall get it with running. So, 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 so. Accent running. Gentlemen follow. Enter Oswald. A, pro a proclaimed prize, most happy, that eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Thou old, unhappy traitor, briefly thyself remember, the sword is out that must destroy thee. Now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it. Edgar interposes. Wherefore, bold peasant, darest thou support a published traitor? Hence, lest the infection of his fortunes take like hold on thee, let go his arm. So I'll not let go, sir, without further occasion. Let go, slave, or thou diest. Good gentlemen, go, you gay, and let poor folk pass, and should have been swaggered out of my life, would not have been so long as tis by a fortnight. Nay, come not near the old man. Keep out, shove all you, or I'll try whether your custard or my fellow be the harder. Shall be playing with you. Out, dung he. Shall pick your teeth, sir. Come, no matter for your voins. They fight, and Edgar knocks him down. Slave, thou hast slain me, villain. Take my purse. If ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body, and give the letters which thou findest about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. Seek him upon the British party, O oh, untimely death. Dies. Know thee well, a serviceable villain, as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. What, is he dead? Sit you down, father. Rest you. Let's see these pockets. The, the letters that he speaks of may be my friends. He's dead. I am only sorry that he had no other deathsmen. Let's see. Uh, reads. Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off. If your will want not, time and place will be fruitfully offered. There is nothing done. If he return the conqueror, then I am the prisoner, and in, in, in his bed my goal, from the loathed warmth whereof delivered me, and supply the place for your labor. Your wife, so I would say, Affectionate servant, Gonril. Oh, indistinguished space of woman's will, a plot upon her virtuous husband's life, and the exchange, my brother. The king is mad. Better I were distract, so should my thoughts be severed from my griefs, and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. Give me your hand. Drum afar off. Far off, methinks I hear the beaten drum. Come, father, I'll bestow you with a friend. Exeunt. Scene seven. A tent in the French camp. Lear on a bed asleep. Soft music playing. Gentlemen and others attending. Enter Cordelia, Kent, and Doctor. Oh, that sweet how shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short, and every measure fail me. Pardon me, dear madam. Yet to be known shortens my made intent. My boon I make it that you know me not till time and I think meet. Then be it so, my good lord. How does the king? Madam, sleep still. Oh, you kind gods, cure this great branch in his abused nature. The untuned and jarring senses, oh, wind up of this child-changed father. So please, your majesty, that we may wake the king. He hath slept long. Be governed by your knowledge and proceed. The sway of your own will, is he arrayed? Be by, good madam, when we do wake him. 
I doubt not of his temperance. Oh, my dear father, restoration, hang thy medicine on my lips and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Had you not been there, father, these white flakes had challenged pity of them. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds, to stand against the deep dread bolted thunder in the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross lightning? To watch poor Purdue with this thin helm. Mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should not have not stood that night against my fire. And wast thou fain, poor father, to hovel thee with swine and rogues forlorn? In short and musty straw, alack, alack, tis wonder that thy life and wits at once had not concluded all. He wakes. Speak to him. Madam, do you. Tis fittest. How does my loyal, royal lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon the wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. When did you die? Still, still far wide. He's scarce awake. Let him alone a while. Where have I been? Where am I, fair daylight? I am mightily abused. I should even die with pity to see another thus. I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. <laughs> Would I were assured of my condition? Oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hands in benediction oh. o'er me. No, sir, you must not <laughs> kneel. Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish father, man. Four score and upward, not an hour more or less. And to kneel plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and know this man, yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what this place is and all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I am, I am. Be your tears wet, yes, faith. I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me. For your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause. No cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more till further settling. Will it please your highness walk? You must bear with me. I pray you now, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Exit, act five, scene one. The British camp near Dover. Enter with drums and colors. Edmund, Regan, gentlemen, and soldiers. Our sister's man is certainly miscarried. This to be doubted, madam. No, sweet lord. You know the goodness I intend upon you. Tell me, but truly, but then speak the truth. Do you not love my sister? In honored love. But have you never found my brother's way to the forfended place? That thought abuses you. 
I am doubtful that you have been conjunct and bosomed with her, as far as we call hers. No, by my honor, madam. I shall never show, I never shall endure her. Dear my lord, be not familiar with her. Fear me not. She and the duke her husband. Enter with drumming colors, Albany, Goneril, and soldiers. Our very loving sister will be met. Sir, this I hear. The king is come to his daughter with others whom the rigor of our state forced to cry out. Why is this reasoned? Combine together against the enemy. For these domestic and particular broils are not the question here. Sister, you'll go with us? No. It is most convenient, pray you, go with us. Oh, ho, oh, I know the riddle. I will go. As they go out, enter Edgar, disguised. If e'er your grace had speech with man so poor, hear me one word. Before you fight the battle, ope this letter. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound from him that brought it. Wretched though I seem, I can produce a champion that will prove what is about you here. If you miscarry, your business of the world hath so an end and machination ceases. Fortune love you. Stay till I have read the letter. I was forbidden. When time shall serve, let but the herald cry, and I'll appear again. Scene two, a field between the two camps. Alarm within. Enter with drumming colors, King Lear, Cordelia, and soldiers over the stage and exeunt. Enter Edgar and Gloucester. Away, old man, give me thy hand, away. King Lear hath lost, he and his daughter ta'en. Give me thy hand, come on. No farther, sir, a man may rot even here. What, in ill thoughts again, men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Rightness is all, come on. And that's true too. Exeunt, scene three, the British camp near Dover. Enter in conquest with drumming colors. Edmund, King Lear, and Cordelia as prisoners. Some officers take them away. Good guard until their greater pleasures first be known that are to censure them. We are not the first who with best meaning have incurred the worst. For the oppressed king I am I cast down. Myself could else out frown false fortune's frown. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in a cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and we'll talk with them too who loses and who wins who's in who's out and take upon us the mystery of things take them away he that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven and fire us hence like foxes wipe thine eyes Ere they shall make us weep, we'll see them starve first. Come. Exeunt King Lear and Cordelia, guarded. Come hither, Captain. Hark, take thou this note. Go follow them to prison. One step I have advanced thee. If thou dost as this instructs thee, thou dost make thy way to noble fortunes. Know thou this, that men are as the time is. To be tender-minded does not become a sword. Thy great employment will not bear question. Either say thou do it, or thrive by other means. We'll do it, my lord. Mark, I say instantly, and carry it so as I have set it down. Exit. Flourish. Enter Albany, Goneril, Reagan, another captain, and soldiers. Sir, you have shown today your valiant strain, and fortune led you well. You have the captives that were the opposite of this day's strife. Sir, I thought it fit to send the old and miserable king to some retention, 
with him I sent the queen, my reason all the same, and they are ready tomorrow or at further space to appear where you shall hold your session. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. Not so hot. In his own grace he doth exalt himself, more than in your addition. Lady, I am not well, else I should answer from a full-flowing stomach. Let the drum strike and prove my title thine. Stay it. Hear reason. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason, and in thine attaint the skilded serpent. For your claim, fair sister, I bar it in the interest of my wife, till she is subcontracted to this lord, and I, her husband, contradict your bands. If you will marry, make your loves to me. My lady is bespoke. Let the trumpet sound. If none appear to prove upon thy head, thy heinous manifest and many treasons, there is my pledge. I'll prove it on thy heart. Sick. Oh, sick. Not, I'll, I'll never trust medicine. My sickness grows upon me. She is not well. Convey her to my tent. Exit Regan, lead. What are you? No, my name is Loss. By treason's tooth, bear non and canker bit. What's he that speaks for Edmund, Earl of Gloucester? Himself. What says thou to him? Draw thy sword. Thy arm may do thee justice. Here is mine. Despite thy victor sword and fire new fortune, thy valor and thy heart, thou art a traitor. False to thy gods, thy brother and thy father, conspirant against this high illustrious prince, and from the extremest upward of thy head to the descent and dust below thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. In wisdom I should ask thy name, but since thy outside looks so fair and warlike, and that thy tongue some say of breeding breeze, but safe and nicely I might well delay, by rule of knighthood, I disdain and spurn. Back do I toss these treasons to thy head, with the hell-hated lie o'erwhelm thy heart, which, for they yet glance by and scarcely bruise, this sword of mine shall give them instant way, where they shall rest forever. Trumpets, speak! Alarms, they fight, Edmund falls. Save him, save him! This is practice, Gloucester. By the law of arms thou wast not bound to answer, an unknown opposite. Thou art not vanquished, but cousined and beguiled. Shut your mouth, dame, or with this paper shall I stop it. Hold, sir, though worse than any name, read thine own evil. No tearing, lady, I perceive you know it. Gives the letter to Edmund. Say, if I do, the laws are mine, not thine. Who can ar uh, arraign me for it? Exit. Go after her. She's desperate. Govern her. But what art thou that hast this fortune on me? I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where thee he got cost him his eyes. Where have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my lord, bled him, begged for him, saved him from despair, never, oh, fault, revealed myself unto him until some half hour passed when I was armed, not sure, though hoping of this good success, I asked his blessing, and from first to last told him my pilgrimage. But his flawed heart, alack, too weak the conflict to support. To extremes of passion, joy, and grief, burst smilingly. Enter a gentleman with a bloody knife. Help! 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 What, what kind of help? Speak, man. What means that bloody knife? She's hot. It smokes. It came from the heart of... Oh, she's dead. Who dead? Speak, man. Your lady, sir. Your lady and her sister, by her is poison. She has confessed it. Ed Edmund was beloved. 
and won the other poison for my sake, and after slew herself. Even so, cover their faces. I pant for life. Some good I mean to do, despite of mine own nature. Quickly, send, be brief in it, to the castle, for my writ is on the life of Lear and on Cordelia. Nay, send in time. Run, run, oh, run. To who, my lord, who hath the office? Send thy token of reprieve. Well thought on, take my sword, give it the captain. Haste thee for thy life. Exit, Edgar. He hath commissioned from thy wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison and to lay the blame upon her own despair that she fordid herself. <clears throat> the gods defend her. Bear him hence a while. Edmund is borne off. Re-enter King Lear with Cordelia dead in his arms. Edgar, Captain, and others following. Oh! 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 Oh, you are men of stones. And I, your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead, but when one lives, she's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass. If that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. Is this the promised end? For our image of that horror. Fall and seize. This feather stirs. She lives. If it be so, it is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Oh, good, my master. Breathe you away. Tis noble Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderous traitors all! I might have saved her. Now she is gone forever. Cordelia. Cordelia. Stay a little. Huh? What is it thou sayest? Her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low. An excellent thing in woman. I killed the slave that was a hanging me. Tis true, my lords. He did. Did I not, fellow? I've seen the day when my good biting falchion, I would have made them skip. I am old now, and these same crosses spoil me. Who are you? Mine eyes are not the best, I will tell you straight. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated, one of them we behold. This is a dull sight. Are you not Kent? The same. Your servant Kent. Where is your servant Caius? He's a good fellow, I can tell you that. He'll strike it quickly too. He's dead and rotten. No, my good lord, I am the very man. I'll see that straight. That from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. You are welcome hither. Nor no man else. All's cheerless, dark and deadly. Your eldest daughters have fordone themselves and desperately are dead. Aye, so I think. He knows not what he says. In vain it is that we present us to him. And my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Thou'lt come no more? Never, 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 never. Pray you undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do, do, do you see this? Look on her. Look. Her lips. Look. There. Look. There. Thanks. My lord. My lord. Break heart. I prithee break. Look up, look up my lord. Vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. 
He hates him much that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. He's gone indeed. The wonder is he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friends of my soul, we twain rule in this realm, and the gorge state sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. Exeunt with the Dead March. End of play. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Still, it feels kind of weird to clap after this show. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Party. Did it. I mean, that was very, I mean, thanks everybody so much. That was really moving and it was just a pleasure to be part of it. Um, um, hey, there's a list. Special, special thank you to Andra for, uh, for helping out being our dramaturg. Um, an amazing job. Hey. And also our stage manager, Kirsten. And, um, Beautiful work. And um, I hope everybody <laughs> has a good. <laughs> nice working with you, folks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dom. Thank have you. a great day. Have a great rest of your, rest of your weekends. Yeah, everybody yeah, have a good happy weekend. Mother's Day yeah. too. And a happy Mother's tomorrow. Day. Enjoy Brooklyn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Cool. Did I end it? Yeah. End it. Okay.